Chapter 8, The Angel of Death. O'er hills and veils of gold and green, he passed unheeded and unseen. For going cities, towns, and crowds, gay mansion glittering to the clouds, magnificence and wealth to reach a humbler, sweeter spot, the village and the peaceful cot, the residence of health. Holland. Plague. Well might Mr. Mumpson have appealed for help divine when that fail word struck on his ear. There are no more terrible chapter in human history than those which tell of the appalling havoc wrought by epidemic and contagious diseases. Most of these direful scourges of the human race, the Black Death, the plague, the cholera, have had their birthplace in the East. But from time to time, they have broken their native bounds and have swept over Europe in a very tempest of death. Throughout the Middle Ages, medical science can hardly be said to have existed. And the origin and mode of propagation of these frightful maladies were quite unknown. The, the terrific force of these epidemics baffled such weak attempts at remedy as were made and left the survivors surrounded by heaps of the putrid dead to pray to such horrors and panic as rendered reasonable and systematic action almost impossible. The accounts given of the Black Death, which swept over Europe in the 14th century, are so awful. The record of deaths so enormous that we would fain believe the med medieval chroniclers to have exaggerated. It was indeed a miserable epoch. Whole provinces lay desolate by war. The towns, necessarily confined within their fortifications, undrained, uncleansed, and reeking with the elements of disease. The vitality of the people reduced by hardship and famine. It needed by a spark, as it were, to kindle the dire flame, Re resistless, till it has absolutely exhausted the material on which it fed. The plague, which was no doubt a form of the Black Death, though modified it in its symptoms, visited England several times during the 16th and 17th centuries. But the memory of these earlier visitations is absorbed and swallowed up, as it were, in the terrible outbreak of 1665 to 66, known as the Plague of London. The disease, important apparently from the Levant, has made great ravages in Amsterdam and Rotterdam in the year 1663. And from Holland, no doubt, the infection was brought to London towards the close of the following year, 1664. Every English reader is familiar with the story of the Plague of London, which during its prevalence is computed to have carried off 100,000 persons or say, one sixth of the entire population of that time. The story which we have now to tell is that of a place where five out of every six were stricken down in the course of a few months. The plague of Eam is thus the most destructive visitation on record in proportion to the population exposed to it. But by God's mercy, this fiercest and most cruel outbreak was the last. There have been terrible epidemics of fever, smallpox, and cholera in England during the two centuries that have rolled by since. The graves of Eam were so hastily opened and closed, but the plague, properly so called, has never re reappeared. How, by the heroic cell devotion of these poor villagers, stimulated and directed by the example and teaching of two noble spirits, the dread melody was kept within narrow limits and hindered from sowing itself far and wide over the surrounding country. 
it is in great measure the object of this tale to show. Long after Mr. Stanley had left him, Mumpison continued to pace up and down his little study, deep in meditation. And though the full horror of the future was in mercy hidden from him, he formed a clear enough conception of the actual position of affairs and of the crisis that was inevitably impending. Six persons had now been carried off by the same mysterious malady and two more were reported as ill. The morrow, being the last day of September, would witness two funerals, and who dare say that the next month would not be opened in a similar way? That these awfully sudden deaths were due to a common cause could not reasonably be, be doubted, and the rector foresaw that before the morrow closed, the entire village would be smitten with panic. Long and earnestly did he pray that night for grace to strengthen and direct him in the terrible emergency that lay before him. He felt his own strength to be but perfect weakness. And with shame did he recall those restless, ambitious aspirations which had made him long for a wider sphere of action. Might not the present one so circumstantial cried and lately even scorned yet proved too large for him how the more he thought of them did the dread possibilities of the near future widen out before him was he the young and comparatively untried divine equal to the sublime task that seemed to lie before him he who had joined himself to earth by such sweet chords of connubial and parental love as thy days, so shall thy strength be. The words of gracious promise suggested by Mr. Stanley came flowing into his mind, and soon he felt his spirit refreshed and established. Three resolves the rectors came to on his knees that night. First, not to be over curious and anxious about the future, but from day to day to do what's, whatsoever came to hand strenuously and as unto the Lord, and not to men. Second, to strive earnestly with his people that they should not give way to panic, nor be flying precipitately, risk spreading the contagion abroad to other places. Thirdly, in no extreme extremity to desert his people, but ever to put his faith in God. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. While Mumpison was registering these vows as made in the presence of God, Thomas Stanley was telling his brother John, with whom we resided, the events of the day, the scene by Sarah Seidel's bed, the visit to the long unfamiliar rectory, the kindness of Mumpison and his wife, and above all, the reported illness of Elizabeth Thorpe and Matthew Bands. I did admire much the fortitude and determination of that young man. And from my heart do I thank God for the same, said Thomas Stanley to his brother. You'd be exposed to much burial too, brother, by your close intercourse with so many of the people in these parts, remarked John. Truly, it is a small thing for me, whose course is well nigh run to meet a few perils more, answered Thomas. My most true yoke fo fellow has been called away, and now my son has come to man's state. But as I thought tonight of these two pretty dears whom I but lately beheld playing in Delph and looked upon their beautiful and delicate mother, I wondered at the calmness with which Mr. Mumpison could face such a future as I might fear lies before us. You, John, will shortly be taking your journey to Chesterfield. These last words were added quickly and with an anxious glance towards his brother. I do not depart from him, Thomas, till I see how it fare with thee and with the people, said John quietly. But the affairs at Chesterfield are urgent and business is not likely to be put aside. Not lightly, 
but at times there may be weighty reasons enough and more so to justify neglect. I stay with thee, brother, at least till the uttermost of this thing to be known, be it for good or ill. It will be a sore thing if once this contagion be spread abroad to other places, said Thomas Stanley in an anxious voice. That we, we must indeed strive to heal her by our most earnest efforts, replied John. Thus, consulting together, the two brothers, each anxious for the other's safety, let the time slip by. So while the young rector, full of anxious thoughts, paced his room alone, his noble fellow worker was no less busily occupied with schemes and resolutions in which assuredly self and the safety of self had no part. Thus, the night advanced, and there was wailing and fear in more than one household, as the mysterious shadow crept from place to place, marking out its earliest victims. <laughs>